everybody welcome back to the channel sorry i lost my introduction i just woke up and hey for today's video i interviewed somebody who detransitioned her name is alia and she shares her experience online and i found her i came across her page she posts on youtube and she posts on tiktok and her experience was transitioning from female to male back to female i feel like these experiences are very important to share i mean just based on my last video and based on what i see online all the time it's i feel like trans people and detrans people are always bashing heads i feel like these experiences are really important to talk about i think they should be out there so when i came across her page and the way that she was sharing her experience i really appreciated it it helped open my eyes to things that i might not see or i might not notice or pay attention to when it comes to detransitioning and, and i'm just happy that i got to have this real raw conversation with her hopefully this helps you guys understand more things about detransition it did for me if anybody out there is feeling the way that she did or the way that she does even better that you get to see her page if you haven't already yeah without further ado i will let you go watch that now so uh hey thank you for watching i will see you later hey everybody what's up how you doing so today i'm going to take a little interview and uh you can start off by introducing yourself yeah um my name is alia ishmael um i live in detroit michigan i'm 28 years old um, and I talk about my detransition and my transition online. I was going to tell you how I came across your page too. I came across your page on TikTok. Yeah. And I have watched a lot of content surrounding anything trans, obviously. And I've come across so many detransition videos and stuff like that. I wanted to do my research because I feel like it's an important topic to be discussed. And there, I have watched so many and i've seen so many posters so many videos about detransition where a lot of people talk about it in a negative light as opposed yeah. to just sharing their experience and they just they say they act like it's i don't know they just act like it's a very negative experience so when i came across your page yeah. i was like wow someone's talking about this in a way where it's educational it's not fear mongering there's no like it is literally just your experience and you're sharing mm -hmm. it with people to let them know hey this is what i went through and i'm just letting you know so yeah and i was like wow we need more people like this to share their stories and you know without that just <sighs> fucking negative negativity around it i don't know if you yeah have you you must have watched a lot of detransitioner videos and stuff like that i actually didn't um okay i yeah i'm okay so when i decided to detransition i obviously went online to be like okay what are these feelings that i'm having right um that was back in like the early summer of 2020 and there was one person that i found on youtube just one like and i didn't see anything anywhere else like I even searched on Facebook. Like I felt like an old person. I was like, did someone even make like a status about this? Like I searched high and low everywhere. And I wasn't like really on Twitter. I wasn't on um, Reddit. Like I did post on Reddit once I found it, but I just, I think I did like one, maybe two posts on the D-Trans like Reddit, like, yeah, three years ago now. Um, but the person that I saw um, there, their name is Ryan, I believe. Um, and I saw a couple of their videos, but it wasn't like, I wasn't like, oh my God, I connect to this person so much. It was more so I was just looking for the physical aspect of detransitioning. I was like, well, what is this going to look like for me? Like, as far as like how my body is going to change. Um, that was what I was like my first and foremost, because it's not that I'm superficial in that sense, but I need to see like, what I'm going to look like, just like anyone else does when they transition medically, they want to see what hormones and surgery can do for the body um, to help connect the body and the mind, right? And even then, I didn't see anyone that looked like me. And what I mean by that is, I was very masculine. I mean, I had a full beard, like, I don't really care to use this word, but like, I passed, like, you know, all these things. And some of the people that I saw just didn't reach that extreme side of the binary, you know, of that masculinity and go back. And so it was really like hard for me to connect with anyone. I think I tried to message one person, maybe two people, and they didn't even respond. Um, and I don't know if they saw it or, you know, whatever, but it was like slim pickings out there for sure. 
Wow. Mm -hmm. That kind of blows my mind. And that was yeah. back in 2020. Mm -hmm. It was only three years ago. And it was like, I'm going to be honest, even just three years ago, it was looked at something very negative. I mean, people felt very shameful. They felt a lot of regret and um, they didn't probably want to talk about it online. And even when I started to in 2020, I got a lot of negativity from people on TikTok, like especially trans people um, that were in the binary, like not necessarily gender fluid or non-binary people, but um, they were like, you are never trans, don't talk about this. Um, detransitioning is bad, like you're just a cis person, like, you know, all these things. And it blew my mind because I was on hormones for seven years, like, and how much like physical change I went through, how much social change I went through, like that was a real experience for me. And I 100% felt body dysmorphia and gender dysphoria, like those feelings were very much there and still are. Um, and I created like a lot of like content during my transition, um, like to help other people during their transition. And I made support groups. I made a documentary, like I did a lot for the community. And so to see just because I decided to go off of hormones, the flip in a lot of people was like, it was shocking and it was hurtful. And it was, it really like woke me up to the community in a sense of, wow, these people probably didn't really know who I was and didn't really like me for me. They just liked me because I was maybe this binary trans man that had all of these physical changes. And that was maybe something that someone wanted to get. And so I was like inspiration to them for that reason solely, but not like who I am in the inside. That's how it felt. I have seen, I and I do feel like this, a lot of trans people, I've seen a lot of trans people shit on detransitioners too. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there, there have been times where someone, because <laughs> I said I've watched a lot of detransition videos, and there are a lot of times where people are like actually like detransitioners are actually being really mean and they're kind of like, yeah, um, this is my experience. So um, that means essentially that like, you're not really trans and shit like that. And then people go off on them or whatever. But I find it really weird that they would go after you. Because yeah. I think it is really important. And I think there are people who are going to detransition. It's just, I feel like that's inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that we can be right about ourselves 100% of the times. There's also literally a multitude of reasons why people will detransition. There are yeah. so many reasons. It's not just because mm -hmm. they aren't actually trans. There are so right. many reasons that go into it. And it's where we shouldn't be against each other. Like, yeah we go you went through that experience you said you were on hormones for seven years yeah yeah that, like that's that's a full that's a long time it's almost a decade like that's, that's a I, full experience of being treated as a man in this world yeah and yeah. i've been on them for 10 and that's not too yeah. far off from fucking seven mm -hmm. so right. like i if i was still on it i'd be 10 years today oh wow like wow. three, or i'd be nine years or so but like still like if i was still on hormones i'd be nine years right now so we got like the same the same yeah. little timeline going on yeah mm -hmm. you know the thing is is back then when i started hormones it was in 2015 and i had these feelings and these thoughts about myself and i went to a therapist and my doctor and i told them this is how i feel and this is this is you know like what do i do about this and the protocol was you have gender dysphoria hormones and surgery. That was what they used to help people in these situations. But it was just the start of it. So it's like any other medication or surgery in the world, it's not going to work for every single person. And there are people that want to stay on hormones, but can't because their body just rejects it or doesn't take well to it or, you know, whatever the case may be, right? So it is kind of an experiment at that point, right? So you can't really fault other people or use your situation say it didn't work for me I it's not going to work for you because just like any other medication and surgery you have to you know know these things but the other part was detransitioning was never talked about to me I didn't know that that was something that happened and I didn't know that that was something that I could do in the future I I truthfully like did not know that but 
also, this was almost 10 years ago. So we didn't have that information back then to really share. So I can't really fault my therapist, but I was like with my therapist, I went in there for 30 minutes, said how I felt. And she responded with, you have gender dysphoria. You're definitely trans. If I could write you a prescription of one hormones today, I would. And that was problematic for me. Like I actually didn't go back to her for six months because I was like, whoa, like you don't really know me. Like I could, I could literally be lying right now to you just to go on hormones. And you were like ready to give it to me. But because the protocol was, you have to wait six months back then to, in order to get a script and a letter, like she didn't do that. So that day I could have went on hormones if there was no, you know, six month amount of time. And this was someone who was a very known therapist in the state of Michigan, who was working with trans people for years and years and years. So the thing is, is like, I can see both sides of the argument and conversation. I can see how there are doctors and therapists that are very quick to write scripts without doing a lot of internal work. I can see that there's doctors and therapists that are gatekeeping. I, I see both sides. Like it really just is each person, right? Every experience is different. But I think the biggest thing that there's a lack of is the education around gender. I mean, I think like we have these roles and these stereotypes for what it means to be a man and a woman, right? And so when we slightly feel like either or they're like, okay, let's go on to this or let's do this. And it's like, okay, well, let's do a little bit more inner work. There's so many trans men that I've had conversations with when I was still in my transition that were like, as soon as I got my name changed, my surgery done, I was a couple years on hormones. Then I sat there and I was like, okay, let's deal with the emotions now because it didn't heal a lot of the internal stuff that they were struggling with. And it's very common for that. And it doesn't mean that they're not trans, but we're so focused on how we're going to look and the surgeries and the name change and all of that social aspect that we're not actually always doing internal work while that's happening because we're so preoccupied with everything else. And it's kind of like my, my friend worded it he's still on hormones very much identifies as a trans man but he worded worded it in this way where it was like peeling layers of an onion you know it's like you get your surgery it's like this checklist in a sense and you finally get to the root and you're like wait a minute like i still feel uncomfortable even though i'm happy and all these things but like let me talk about why i felt uncomfortable in my body in the first place you know um but it doesn't mean that you can't go on horm hormones and get surgery i think like everything is body modification in some way, right? We get our hair done a certain way. We get tattoos, we get piercings, we get, people get BBLs, fillers, you know, like all these different things, right? Because we want to look and feel good in our body. And so there's nothing wrong with that, but I think we need to like have a little bit more education on why we feel that way as a society and how to combat that in better ways um, for the long run of things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking about the therapist thing. The first appointment yeah. that you went to. Mm -hmm. I know. I sorry. I went like in a whole no. tangent, but yeah, the first appointment that I went to. Yes. No way. Mm -hmm. Holy shit. But something in me was like, hold up. You know, I did eventually go back to her because after about six to eight months of doing some inner work, I, I didn't want to go into my childhood traumas. I didn't want to go into that. Like, I had my mind made up and my focus was on getting hormones because I was like, okay, I want, I want to masculinize my body. So even though I kind of dove into some of my traumas and different things that were bothering me, I didn't fully immerse myself in it. I just, that wasn't what I wanted to do at that time. So it's not like I still made the decision for myself, but I was so preoccupied with everything else around me, you know, and instead of like really reaching within for myself. Okay. Yeah. And when I listen to stories, there's a lot that comes back to like the onion idea, mm -hmm. like, yeah. you know, figuring out yourself or like, you know, why you decided to transition and stuff like that. And it, I don't, it, a lot of people do and have talked about, you know, because in my process, and this was back, this was 
fucking probably around the time that you went it was mm -hmm. two i don't even know i was 16 10 years ago it probably like 2011 i started seeing a therapist but she was very and i I was, I was scared to, I was younger. I was scared to go on hormones and stuff like that, but she, I had many sessions with her and then she wanted me to see a doctor as well and talk about it. And it was a, it was actually a long process before she, she just like wanted to give me hormones. So yeah. to hear you going into somewhere, 30 minutes, whatever. Okay. You have gender dysphoria. Um, I'm sure that, you know, we could explain how we feel and then that can come off as gender dysphoria, but and, or you can literally have gender dysphoria, but you should be having multiple sessions and you should be talking about it more and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be able to get a hormone that easily. And that just, that seriously blows my mind because yeah, a, a lot of the times I talk about, it is not that easy, but that could be anecdotal. Yeah. Wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it wasn't for a handful of others, but then others might have the opposite. Oh, I went in once and uh, yeah, it's like, whoa, yeah. it's, and I can, I guess I don't want to compare it to like medications, but if I went to talk to someone about depression and <laughs> I went in for one session, like, all right, you're, de you're depressed. So let's, I'm just going to prescribe you this instead of like really talking about it and figuring yes. out, you know, do you want to go on medication? Is this medication going to be good for you? What, all that type of stuff. That's, that's. I want to say this, it all stems from money. They're getting paid, you know, like for medications, for surgery, for all of these things. And so some people do take advantage of that. I know we want to think that all medical professionals and all like individuals like that are really trying to help people. And maybe they are, but they're getting paid, Sam. Like the money is a big aspect. I mean, think how much, how many surgeons are profiting off of trans surgeries right now. I mean, it is big and they're getting paid big money right now. And so of course they're going to do it. They're not even this, the surgeons that we all go to for top surgery, right? Uh, what was it? Garamoni in Florida. Um, I went to Dr. Raphael in Tex Plano, Texas. He was a great guy, great bedside manner, you know, all these different things, but he just wants that letter that, that says that I can get this surgery from my therapist. So he's not doing any inner work with me. He just got that letter that said that I can get it. And he's getting that 8,000 from me. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. it's, but that's with anything that you do, like think about medication in a general, like general sense too. Like, what was it in the nineties or early two thousands or I can't remember exactly when, but Oxycontin was, um, uh, prescribed for mild pain and things like that. And people became addicts. They were getting this from their doctors and they became pure addicts. And a lot of people overdosed and died and all of it from a medication that their medical professionals said was okay for them to use. And they were prescribing big amounts to people, like crazy amounts. So wow. no one's ever right in, in the medical fields. Like it, everything is an experiment. And especially when new things come out, people are real quick to jump on it and it could really harm a lot of people, but it comes down to that money. I mean, they were making money for them pills too. You know, I think like we don't think about the other side of that. I don't know, like after I decided to detransition, I kind of like woke up to a lot of things. Like I was like, oh, wow. Like I was in this world of like, I'm being helped and I'm trying to, you know, feel more comfortable. And these people are telling me I got to do this, this, and this. And then when I thought about it, I was like, this is a lot of stuff that I have to do just to feel comfortable in my body. And so long-term I was like, I don't enjoy being a trans man in today's world like that was very difficult for me and there's so many reasons that it is and I think the biggest is like all the social aspects of it my social perceptions of what it means to be a man and how I was raised and gender roles and things like that I was like I don't want to be a trans man but my gender dysphoria is still there I still feel it heavily but I just was like I feel better translated as a feminine person or a woman in this world today Okay. I think it's a lot more intricate than I, than I think people think when it comes to making decisions like that. They're like, okay, you're not trans anymore. And it's like, no, like if I could wake up tomorrow in a six foot five man's body, like big hands, big feet, things like that, like have a penis, I'll, I would be good, but I didn't enjoy being a trans man. 
And I didn't think about that when I was transitioning. I was like, oh, I'm going to be treated like a man. I'm, I'm going to be acknowledged for my masculinity. But I still felt incomplete in my eyes. And that's what mattered the most for me. And it just further made me more depressed because I, I couldn't meet those expectations that I put on myself. Yeah. That was one of my questions that I was going to have for you because <clears throat> I was going to ask if you still feel gender dysphoria. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I believe that gender dysphoria stems from body dysmorphia and a lot of people have body dysmorphia in the world. And it makes sense because of the standards that we put in society on people, right? Like we look at magazines on TV, like this is what you're supposed to look like, or this, what, this is what makes you look good, you know, things like that. So we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people, right? So there's the body dysmorphia right there. And then when we get into the gender, it's how we're treated by our peers. It's how we're treated by our partners, our family members, you know, things like that. And I date men and women, trans or cis, it doesn't matter. But when I was a trans man, I was com treated completely differently by the women in my life, whether they were my partners or friends and how I am now. And I have to accept that and get used to it. But people perceive me completely differently now. Um, but I'm still the same person. So it's like my gender dysphoria is still there for those reasons, you know, like women that maybe I want to date are not acknowledging me how they used to when I was a trans man. And I want them to. That was one of the reasons why I went on hormones, not the sole reason, but that was a reason so when it came to my romantic partners um, and just other, you know, social interactions so it's still there i just kind of changed my perception you could say when i was looking into statistics and stuff like that and people would say um and even just in my own head sometimes i think some people it might be easier to be how they were born and cope with those feelings rather than live in society as a trans person because living in society as a trans person is hard outside and inside it is mm -hmm. hard to do and then you could you could take it either way so which is a very interesting concept to me and i i don't know yeah i like I don't like giving myself shots i didn't like giving myself shots for seven years and if anyone says that they like that <laughs> that's crazy because no one likes getting a shot like you know no. and so having to do that and stay on top of it every week was a lot for me and I don't have to do anything now I just go about my day I never have to take a, any medication and that was a big deciding factor for me I was like I hate medication like I understand there are benefits to medication like if I was dying and they're like hey you need this to survive okay let's do it but I had a choice. And so I decided that this isn't what I want to do anymore. You know, it wasn't at the time that I decided to go off of hormones, my life was no longer dependent on hormones. And so what I mean by that is when I decided to go on hormones, it was like life or death for me. And in, in that moment, like as extreme as that might sound, I, that was like a saving grace for me into seeing a little bit further into my future um and what the possibility of life could look like for me i mean i was severely depressed in my body so hormones at that time was life-saving for me in a sense if you look at it that way and when i realized it wasn't life-saving for me anymore and i didn't need it is when i decided okay it's time to go off um but like i said i feel that way about all medication i mean i barely want to take an a leave when i'm having back pain i don't like medication and i think that like yeah long term of that and like i said the profiting of it and all, i was like i just i don't want to do this anymore so that came into play for me as well yeah as i i don't like taking medication either like i want yeah. i try to not take advil and stuff like that when i'm sick as hell i don't know i just yeah. i don't know why i just don't like it and that was one of you know that was scary getting on tea as well because i was like well i'm i would probably like to take this for the rest of my life unless you know because at one point i can stop but i think that i would like to continue it for the rest of my life but it is something new that you're putting in your body it's scary and i'm one of those people who's like 
um, raging headache, but I don't want to take an Advil. I'll just drink like a fucking gallon of water. Or right, something. right. So, well, also like we don't necessarily know just yet. we're still learning the long term effects of hormone and also like surgery on your body in any form is trauma. Like I even the doctor that I went to for horm hormones, who is still my doctor today, she's amazing. She takes a very holistic approach to everything. So usually when it comes to things that I'm not feeling well, she's giving me like alternative medicine. I, she's not like popping a leave unless like, she's like, okay, you have it, do that. But she's giving me alternative ways to heal myself. And I really like that. I like putting things that are like natural and that I can grow if I need to, you know, things like that into my body a little bit more. Um, and so I think, yeah, like my perception of medication changed heavily within detransitioning too. You know? yeah. Wow. Nice. Yeah. I became like, I just like, I don't like to use the, like, I woke up type of thing, but like, I really woke up. Like I felt like I was on autopilot for a long time. Like not even just because of hormones or anything like that. Like I was so worried about what other people thought of me. I was worried about what everyone else was doing. Um, I always had severe like FOMO. Like I just wasn't paying attention to myself and my feelings. Like I was working every day. I was, I would go out with friends like, and I would get myself so worried about like the stupidest littlest issues or drama or, you know, whatever it was. And when everything shut down in the pandemic, I truly sat with myself for the first time in my life, like sat with myself. And I did some hypnotherapy for my childhood trauma. I microdosed some mushrooms and that <laughs> changed my life. Like for real, I'm like, I'm not even joking. Like I microdosed mushrooms and did that hypnotherapy. And it was like everything in my life just completely changed after that. Like it, it was very, it was a very spiritual feeling and not like in the Bible, Jesus love it. Like it was just very spiritual, like in the sense where I felt very connected to myself. I was no longer dissociating. Like I didn't understand this for the longest time. I didn't know what dissociating it was, but when I was on hormones, I would look in the mirror at myself and, or I would look at my hands and I just felt like I was so out of body all the time. I couldn't explain it. I felt like I was just high. I was like, I would smoke and I'd be like, okay, am I just stoned right now? But like, even times when I wasn't stoned, like I was like, I feel so out of my body right now. And I couldn't explain it. And I just heavily dissociated. And it was like, as soon as I decided to detransition, like that moment, I like, it was like, I remember I sat there, I told this story like on one of my first videos, but I sat there one, one day and I was in the bathroom and I looked at myself and I had this thought and the thought was, what if I dissociated so much from my traumas that I created this identity Isa? And it was like, like, I couldn't explain it. I, I wasn't even thinking about that. Like when I tell you, it was like a thought that just came out of nowhere. I was like, what the hell? And then the next thought I, I had was, I don't have to be on hormones for the rest of my life. And it was like, I had this instant wave of relief over my body that I just couldn't explain. But the weirder part is I didn't know what dissociated meant. I had the word in my thought and I had to Google it because I was like, what does that mean? And I Googled it and I was like, oh my God, that was, that's exactly how I feel. So that's what I mean was like really spiritual for me. It's like my intuition just really told me something in that moment. And I listened to it for the, like the first time in probably like 10 or so years. So it was just like, it, it was very weird 2020 for me. Like it was just really weird. Yeah. And, that and was... I can't explain it. I just can't like, that's the only way I can explain it is like how I just did there. Like, I don't know. It's <laughs> and f sitting in 2020, you literally have sat with yourself like, Okay. yeah you had yeah. to everyone did <laughs> yeah and it was like whoa uh so <clears throat> i wanted to ask you let me look here um I, I don't know if you mentioned this what what age did you transition so i socially started transitioning at i would say like 18 19 and then i medically started transitioning like 2021 okay all right so not the year 2021 but like when i was 20 going into my 21st birthday okay 
Yeah. Um, then when did you detransition? When I was 26 going on 27. Okay. So like a few years ago. So it, it was actually, it was actually two years. Is today February 1st? Yeah. Two years today. Wow. Actually, yeah. It's okay. like two years uh, off of hormones today. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Nice. I'm just trying to think if you already answered this question. What, when did you start to feel, because I felt like I felt gender dysphoria very young. When did you start to kind of realize that you felt different, essentially? Yeah, I mean, definitely from childhood. Um, when I was like really young, so under the age of 13, I was a tomboy. Like I did not see myself different from any other boy. I hung out with them. I played with them. I wore boys clothes. Like I felt comfortable in that and I always had, but my mom, and I don't fault her for this, It's you know, like the time that she was, you know, a mother, she was young, 19, like she was always like wear girls clothes and she would cut my hair like right here. So I couldn't put it back in a ponytail. Like she was like, no, you're going to wear your hair down. Like she was always trying to get me to be more girly, you know? Um, so I felt that like, yeah, from childhood, but I didn't look at it as like, I'm trans. I didn't have those words. I just was like, I felt like a kid. And that's like the most general neutral term that I like, you know, like I was just a kid, you know, wanting to like hang out with other kids and be similar to them. Um, and so it wasn't until I started going through puberty when my breasts started to grow. And that's when I was like, extremely uncomfortable, because I could no longer just wear a shirt. Like I now had to start wearing a bra and I did not want to wear a bra. Um, I actually remember the exact pinpoint moment. Still, I was like 11 or 12 and I was at a festival with a bunch of my friends and it started raining and my shirt started to cling to my chest and I could see it. Like I could start to see like the lump. And I just remember like hunching my shoulders and being like, I got to go home. And my friends were like, why? Like, we're still hanging out. And I was like, no, I need to leave right now. And I called my mom and I had her come pick me up. And like, I remember that moment like it was yesterday and how uncomfortable I felt. Yeah. I like basically same went for me, kind of same timeline. I was a tomboy growing up, all that stuff, Um, which obviously, and I know this, it doesn't mean that, you know, we're trans, but when you think about it, from the standpoint with all of the feelings that came with it. Um, I was a tomboy when I reached like 12 and I had the same feelings. I was like, I don't want to wear, I just want to wear a t-shirt. I don't like this. And it feels, it, it doesn't, it doesn't feel right. And then all my friends were kind of, they were cool with it. They're, they were excited almost to grow yeah. up. And yeah. I was not. And I was like, mm -hmm. why do I feel like that? It's, it yeah. shouldn't like, I understand bodies, body bodies changing and that could definitely be uncomfortable for kids because you're going from a kid and you get you're getting older mm -hmm. but it was i i did not i didn't like the fucking feeling and yeah as i got older it progr progressed and i was like this isn't i really don't think this is normal because when i was 14 15 and you know uh girls just started being more girly or whatever and i felt stuck with these uncomfortable feelings surrounding everything that I am. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I think what's slight bit different though, is when I got into like the eighth grade and going into my freshman year in college, I started to be more feminine and I enjoyed it. Um, I was like, how you see me now. I was this when I was in high school throughout my entire high school, four years. Um, I was very feminine, but I still felt masculine internally and I always had liked girls um, from a young age, like kindergarten, first grade, I always had crushes on girls and like they were crushes. It was not like, oh, she's pretty. I want to look like her. Like I really, I remember my first childhood love, like all of these things. And so that made me different from the other girls around me and my friends. Um, and then it was my senior year and I cut all my hair off because no one was acknowledging me as being someone who was bisexual or gay. And I had dated boys and all of that. And so I was like, 
that back then when you're 17, like what you, your perceptions, like when you look at them in retrospect, you're like, that doesn't mean that. But that's like back then, because I had no representation of anyone gay. I was the first person to come out as gay in my high school. So like, there might've been people that we were like, you might be, but they <laughs> never came out. You know, I was like, this is who I am. And so I cut all my hair off and that put me into a more masculine role. And it wasn't what I was like seeking a little bit, but even just that like caused me to feel less and less feminine that pushed me more and more into that masculinity, which caused me to transition. I think if I never cut my hair off, I probably wouldn't have went so into that masculine role. And it sounds so stupid that it's just a haircut but at that time during then like that is what was the you know avalanche for me um but when I was a kid I saw myself as I like when I talk about my trans self like you know as Issa like I saw myself with short hair when I was like eight nine ten years old and parts of me is like are were those like premonitions in a sense for myself like I, I had always saw myself like that, but I never was that. And then I did, you know, transition and I kind of looked like that person that I had imagined myself as when I was a young child. And to counter that thought was when I transitioned, I had so many dreams and things like in this form. And it was like really weird that I would always dream of myself in this feminine form like this. And then seven years later, I'm back to that form. So I was, I don't know, I get into like spiritual stuff like that. So I was, I just like, I have a high intuition and sometimes I'll see something and I'm like, don't do that or do that. And it ends up being right, you know? And so it's really interesting, like my subconscious, how it viewed myself. I don't know. Weird. Okay. I get that. But like, I've been very fluid in my expression. And so... And it's like really like the first 10 years, I was very masculine. The next 10 years, I was pretty feminine. And now this next 10 years, I was pretty masculine. And then now, now I'm back to femininity. You know what I mean? It's like, it's really weird how I'm, I went in these waves. Right. And so when you cut your hair, did you feel like, did you feel more obligated to to just take that to the next step because you were in that masculine like I think yes and no yeah like yes and no like what it was was I had I cut my hair and I was still a little feminine and then it was like I slowly started to progress back into like my masculine appearance and then because I was a pretty curvy person I always, that's where the body dysmorphia comes into play is I always liked someone who had a more like straighter body. And even if they were feminine, they just weren't at, didn't have wider hips like I did, you know, things like that. And so I think I was always trying to achieve that body type. And I thought that hormones were going to help that. Even though I was like looking really masculine, my first like two years on hormones, I loved how I looked. But the longer that I went on hormones, I mean, I just got hairier and more manly and burly and all these things. And then that's when I was like, hell no, I don't like this. I mean, like I said, I had a full beard, you know, all that. But my first two years, I did look kind of like androgynous and a little, but like still masculine. And my body, I was a little bit thinner. My body was a lot straighter, you know? And so like, that was a good time for me. And so like that came into play a little bit, you know? And then it was like, I... I guess I could have went out of hormones, but I didn't know that I could, you know what I mean? I, I just, I was like, okay, well, I got to keep going on because this is the medication that I take. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, like I, was... I just had this idea that like, I, okay, I chose to be on hormones. So now I have to do this for the rest of my life. I never knew there was any other alternate road in a sense. Were you, were you scared to come off of them because of how difficult that would be with people around you or even yourself? Um, no, because I never thought about going off of them. Like, because like, that's what I mean by that. Like when I was like, I didn't know there was an alternate road. Like I never had the thought about going off of hormones until I had that thought 
in 2020. Like when I had that thought, I was like, oh yeah, I'm doing this. There was no, like at first I went off for about four months in 2020. And this is where like a lot of other things come into play. And what I mean by where I was like very distracted by other things, I heavily relied on my identity with my romantic partners. Um, I don't know how you feel, but I know I've talked to some other trans people and I think like when I got love in my life, I did not want that to go anywhere because I didn't think I was going to get it again. Um, and so if I was with someone who was very feminine presenting, I would like, be more mass and I'd be that counter partner and mostly because I felt comfortable in that role and that was all I knew growing up my entire life was a man and a woman and so I was this masculine person dating this feminine person like that's all I knew and what I felt comfortable in roles with so I got into a relationship and I was like well I'll just go back on hormones like she likes me like this I, I'm okay with it because I've already been doing this for seven years and like, I feel good right now, you know, and that relationship ended and I was right back with my feelings and I was, I finally was just like, I'm done. And then that's when in February of 2021, when I was like, I'm going off 100%. Yeah. Got to do, got to do that for yourself. Yeah. yeah. But it took me a minute to realize that, you know, like I said, like no one wants to, let me tell you something. Ain't no one want to go to therapy to work on themselves. Like that is the scariest thing ever. Like having to confront yourself with your thoughts and your feelings. That's extremely difficult. There are a lot of people in this world that still to this day do not do that. No. And so, you know, like, and what I was doing was not like the norm. No one, no one was detransitioning. No one was talking about it really. Like, so I, like that was a really terrifying feeling for sure. It had that had to be and yeah. that still blows my mind because now if you go on youtube and you type in detransition stories there they are coming there's more now i will say i don't think that i'm like the person that started this or you know whatever but i think like i probably made it very comfortable for people to start coming out um and talking about their feelings with that like because i would say after i really started blowing up I started seeing, I started seeing more on TikTok. It's not like I was see, I wasn't seeking it out. Like if it came across my for you page or someone sent something to me, that was how that went. Um, but like, I would say I probably made it a safer space for people to be able to talk about their feelings. Yeah. That's fuck. That's amazing because yeah. they should be able to, and they should be able to share their stories. And I seriously feel like those experiences are very scary to post publicly because no. you can literally get it from both sides be like right. well, you're not really trans <laughs> or whatever blah blah then the other people are saying see this is this is like a problem you can get it from all sides and just even that i just think about it and when people detransition because it's already hard to transition but to do that and then be self-aware that this wasn't right for me and then to come out and say it is a scary thing because yeah. people are fucking assholes and especially on the internet so yeah for sure on the internet yes and i'm yeah. i'm really happy that i came across your page because just uh, all i already said this in the beginning but i don't see people sharing their experience the way that you do you're you're very understanding and i just feel like a lot of people because I'm on I'm online all the time. A lot of people are just they approach it in a in a, a mean way, uh, and that's not. I, I I'm all about like respect and kindness, and I love to yeah. learn about people's experiences. And I'm very understanding, so I expect the same from other people. But you know, not everybody's like that. Yeah, you know, I appreciate that. I um, I think I look at it as like. No one's got the manual to be a human in this world. You know what I mean? Like we're all just trying to figure it out. But I think what helps me understand more is I, it's not that I agree with the people who are being negative, but I can understand their feelings of frustration. I can understand their feelings of hurt. And, and it, like I said, it's not okay, but I, 
I can see where they're coming from. And so what ends up happening is they're like shooting all this ammo at people and then they're shooting it back. Right. But sometimes when you just sit there and have that conversation with them and like open their mind a little bit more, they end up being a little bit more understanding as well. And so I try to talk about my situation a little bit more in depth and be extremely vulnerable, like and very honest, you know, like even if what I say isn't correct or, you know, whatever, like I'm just expressing how I feel in that moment, you know? Um, and I think like, ever, like there's so many things, like just you said earlier that contribute to all the decisions that we make, you know? And so it's like, it's never just black and white. Like we have to see all sides of the conversation, no matter what. And we have to understand people, but I have had like some, like, you know, not arguments, but like back and forth with some people where I'm like, you're being ignorant to like what you're saying to me. And and I kind of do shoot back. And I think some people don't expect me to do that because they're like, oh, like I'm so I'm a little bit more proper online and things like that. But in the real life and when I feel like I'm being disrespected, disrespected, like I'm definitely going to go back at you. Um, and I even just lately, a couple of people have been commenting on my video about Blair White and like the video that she put me in and stuff like that. And I was just like, I'm going to say something about this because I feel disrespected because I am so open and vulnerable about my story. And you're portraying me in a light that is extremely incorrupt to millions of people. And so I'm not going to stay quiet and be all, um, you know, understanding and things like that. Like, you know what you're doing in your actions. And a lot of people do that, you know, and so they need to be held accountable for that. Yes, I that I think that was the initial TikTok that I saw. And yeah, I, you know, I, I watched Blair's video after I saw your TikTok and her, just her like the way that she would speak about detransition is I feel like it's it's disrespectful. Um, this is this is what I mean by people fear mongering. And my previous video, the video of Blair White talking about detransitioning, and then it's kind of just and this is what prompted me to do a lot of research. It, it's I just feel like the video is bad. It wasn't good. There were some good points in and from, incorrect. It's yeah, just and incorrect. Yes. Like that's the biggest. It's like it's okay, say your opinion, you know, whatever, but like, it's incorrect. Yes. And, and I'm all about fact, like factual things. That's why I feel like I analyze so much because I'm like, I can see how they feel. And like the people who are being really negative about it, I can see that. But they're, they're speaking on factual things. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not just like, there's a couple people, not even just myself that specifically say that they do not regret their transition and she puts me in a video that says that i regret my transition but there's nothing wrong with you physically you've got the kind of looks that make other girls mentally ill okay so this person transitioned from female to male back to female and as you can see there's still facial hair and you know that to me is very very sad so stop it you don't need any plastic surgery you're perfect. Oh no. She was beautiful. And I'm, I'm not trying to be insensitive or imply that she can't get back to that state, but she was beautiful. Every time I watch one of these, I think like, it hits me maybe in a different way than like someone who was watching this and is not trans or has never even thought about it. It's like just knowing everything that it took to get to this point in my transition and to be me and like, the idea of going back on that is so insane to me. It's like inconceivable. And so shout out to her for, you know, continuing on. I mean, that like right there, that's bullet number one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and so I'm like, and then people will talk about, like she said, she's like, oh, she was so beautiful, which is implying that I currently am not beautiful. Yep. No matter which way, like that is what it implies. You know, you can twist it how you want to, to make her, you know, shine and all that, but that is what she said. And she's having pity for my situation. It's not sympathy, you know? And so imagine someone made a video about trans people, you, Blair White, like all the people that are on YouTube, really big, right? And they were like, ah, Sam was so beautiful back then. Like, I feel so, 
so bad that he's going through this and you feel good about your situation. And someone's like, I feel so bad for him and what he's doing and all these things. And you're like, I don't like, I'm happy about what is, what has happened. No one's seeing it that way. They're looking at it like, oh, like she's speaking well. And I'm like, no, she's not. She's having pity on us. That's like me making a video using her as saying that like, oh man, she should have, she should have never transitioned. Like, I, I hope she can get back to that if she ever wants to like, come on. D that shit. Yeah. That shit made Daddy. me roll my eyes right. when I saw it and she like, and she was so beautiful. It's like, no, you've been beautiful the whole time, even through right. all like, of it. Don't, exactly. you don't say that to somebody. Or and it's about very somebody. superficial and it just, it, yeah. I want to say it's superficial in the sense where how did she feel when she first started transitioning? There is a lot of inner transphobia that's in that statement for herself, because think about it like this. I, when she was in the beginning of her transition, when you were in the beginning of your transition, we're all in that little bit of an androgynous state, right? And sometimes we don't feel comfortable in our androgyny and that's fine. But to say that, like of how I looked in that moment, maybe I still had a little bit of facial hair, you know, things like that. Like that is what she was saying. That, and that's, that's her own inner transphobia for herself. So, so there was a moment that she probably looked similar to me in her transition. And now that she has reached the expectations that she wanted, she's no longer in that in a sense, you know what I'm trying to say? Right. Like yeah. it, it was kind of like, okay, I was in this fluidity of my gender and I'm, I, was so beautiful because I fit that stereotypical feminine woman, like aesthetic, right? And so now that she does, you know what I mean? Like, it's like that very, it's very superficial, that statement. It is. And maybe I'm analyzing it a little bit more than the, you know, the, uh, you know, people that are watching it, but that's how I viewed that. Like, I really did view it as like an inner transphobia for herself because she is very in the binary and that's fine if that's what you want to do but you're kind of knocking someone who's in their fluidity going through something. Right. And I don't know. It's, it's just inappropriate. And yeah, to stem off of what you were saying, it's just, I, I've also seen her make fun of people's appearance all the time. Anyways, like different trends. I hate, I literally hate like Sam, I hate bullying behavior. Yeah. Like I hate it. I was bullied heavily in high school. Like, still can continue to be bullied by some people like whether it's online or in real life like i hate bullying and i hate talking about people's looks because that's something you can't help you know what i mean like that, yes. that is who that person is and just because you don't think they're beautiful does not mean that they are not beautiful yep you know and what i'm saying so yeah i hate that i hate it and i want to i don't mean to cut you off but i want to talk about that um I cannot think of her name right now. And I apologize that I cannot think of her name, but she went um, viral on Twitter for detransitioning, talking about her um, uh, like going bald and her hair thinning. And there were a couple of trans guys that I know like, you're... made fun of her for that. I know and you're talking I about. I did not like that at all. I thought that I, I didn't really see, I didn't watch her entire video and know exactly what she said. But from some of the things that I did see, I did not think that she was like saying don't do that like i think she was talking about her experience and then for her to be bullied on her looks is just like taking a knife and just twisting it yeah i and that is something that i talk about in my in my previous video okay, i think we're talking yeah. about the same person casey yeah casey yes casey yeah yes so when i initially came across all those posts i didn't think anything about appearance i wasn't going to be like well you you're just mad because like you lost your hair or some shit like that because right. i'm not I really just don't care about people's appearance. It's it's low hanging fruit. What I mm -hmm. did is I took the points that they said in their video, and I was like, um, well, I don't even remember what I said. I said yeah. something about testosterone. I can put the tweet up here, but uh, yeah, I just I'm not, and it's just it's it's unnecessary. It doesn't have to be talked about. We don't have to talk about people's appearance yeah. and bring them down. Let's talk about the stuff that's coming out of their mouth as opposed well, right to yes and like i said opinions. i didn't watch the entire video i said i just saw like a couple of snippets of it you know um and i did reach out to her because here's the thing is with all of that bullying that's where i kind of looked at it was like 
she's feeling these feelings and maybe she's expressing them not correctly or saying things that maybe um, is like a blanket statement, right? Like that some people who detransition do say, right? But she didn't need to be bullied about her looks. So think about you're already down. You know what I mean? You're already frustrated. You're already angry. And then the people that you felt a part of the community are like now talking about you like in that bullying way. And I can see why I'd be like, okay, well, fuck them. I don't even want to talk to them at all. You know what I mean? And so my biggest thing is like, if I find someone who is really down and they're saying those things, let me try and talk to them and help them accept some of the the decisions that they made in their life and, and decrease that feeling of shame and guilt for their decisions. And um, we didn't end up talking. I kind of, usually what happens is like, I'll send a message and I'll say, you know what, here's my number. If you want to talk about your feelings or anything like that, reach out to me. If you don't want to, you don't have to. I just want to extend this. So like, if you ever feel like you need to, I'm right here for that, but there's no pressure to, you know? And I think like, that's the biggest way that I can contribute to try and help some people that have a lot of those negative feelings. Yeah. Cause and- like, like, let's not bully each other. Let's work together at this. Let's have a conversation about these feelings. That's the only way we can fix it. So we're not yes. like hit, you know? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then, and this just brought up a point in my head. So then when all that stuff happened, because this was a video that I wanted to make, um, hold on, let me, let me check Twitter for a second. I want to see. <laughs> uh, when you, because, but I guess, I guess it just depends on how things come off because, you know, do, does Casey go by um, she? Yeah, I, th- I, I thought think so. so. I can't, yeah. I can't find her page. Then why can't I find her page? Maybe it's because I have fucking, hold on, let me see. Um, Cause there are definitely were tweets that were at, like, you probably didn't see them. They were they They were not nice. There was like stuff about, uh, let me see. This had to be- yeah, I'm not on Twitter. Like, I think I only went on Twitter to not like I'll use gender neutral pronouns oh. now because now you have me second guessing. But um, I only went on Twitter literally to send them a message. So like, I am to- not on Twitter at all. So I don't see anything. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah, the page is deleted. Twitter is deleted. Um. So what happens is both people are bashing heads because like one person and you know maybe somebody is mad during their detransition and stuff and then you're obviously naturally going to have like if someone's saying i fucking wish i had the tweet because i would have showed you but now i don't think i can when somebody is saying like let me just check one more time basically they aren't in the best taste so but what happens Mm. is i i came at it with a more of an educational approach um, and I said like, whatever I needed to say, but then you will have people that are just kind of being assholes back. But I, I do like to take the approach of, I could be a little sarcastic. I can be a little bit rude sometimes, but when I think about these situations, I want to be able to have these conversations without arguing because it is something that's happening and it's something that we should understand. And it, it's just it doesn't have to be this way. There doesn't have to be yeah. hate from both sides, but one side might start being an asshole. Then the other yeah. side's going to be an asshole, vice mm-hmm. versa. So it's like, now you're getting nowhere. Instead of sharing these conversations, we've shared these experiences and you don't have to put each other down for it. And yeah, I'm like, you support trans people, like you yeah. support my transition and shit like that. And I still get it. It's just, it's so, it's so you have to you have to have the understanding that everyone's different, you know, like you can still yeah. maybe not agree on certain things and sp- still have respect for everyone, you know, like I know that there probably are some things that I think that like some things that I think that I'm like, ah, maybe I wouldn't like if I was in that situation or if I had a child or like, maybe I wouldn't do that, but I'm not going to be like, you can't do that with your situation because I'm not doing it with my situation. Like everyone has a different experience, you know, and, yeah. Because of those experiences, we then start to have different mindsets and decisions for that. But it doesn't mean that I have to not like you for those things. Obviously, if you're disrespecting me, that's a whole different story. But like, there, whether you're trans 
or not, or you have transitioned or, and detransitioned or, you know, whatever side of the spectrum you're on, like, there are some people that are still in their transition that agree with me on certain things and that don't, and people who are cisgender that agree with me on things and don't, like, it doesn't really, I think sometimes we forget that, like, we're in this, like, trans bubble, and so it's, like, about transition, all that, we're fighting with each other, but we're actually very similar, and even people who don't transition or identify as trans, like, they have similar feelings about a lot of the social structures and gender roles and things like that that we have as well, but because we go through this experience, we're like, you don't know what I'm feeling or what I'm talking about, but a lot of times they do. You just have to kind of change your perception of it a little bit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, some people who don't ever transition can still have gender dysphoria and body dysmorphia and have all these feelings, but just not act on it or not yes. let it consume their entire life and thought and being. And it's not bad that if you let it consume your entire thought and being, everyone's experience is different. So your gender could be on the forefront of your mind because of certain experiences that you're having. And the other person could also have those same feelings, but gen they're, they're distracted or bothered or having a feeling about something that's a little bit different that's prioritizing their mind and thoughts does that I, yeah, make sense i love that yeah yeah because i do believe that you can still be trans without actually transitioning you can mm -hmm. still have if i didn't transition or whatever i still have all the fucking i would feel the same exactly. way exactly i would choose not to transition because of mm -hmm. x y and z um, exactly so yeah i i love that it's yeah the, the, i think like we've today I don't mean to cut you off but i was going to say like today we look at trans as like all of the medical aspects of it but in many cultures and a long time ago before medications and surgeries and all of that were even a thing <laughs> these people still existed and felt these ways and then we started coming up with ideas of like okay how can we combat that and it ended up being with the medical world and things like that but like people have always had these feelings of not feeling comfortable in their bodies or just not feeling at one with themselves and their experience was just completely different but still like it's always been around so being trans doesn't mean medically transitioning and getting the surgeries you know but I think like that's what we like honed it in on and that's like how we identify someone someone who changes their gender or things like that but we all have those feelings in some form right and it's been around for a long time and that's why mm -hmm. people i hate the conversation about it well it's just like a new thing or whatever no but now we have all there's so many resources there's so much mm -hmm. stuff like that um that people can actually transition now and it's definitely less scary than it was literally yeah. 10 years ago 50 yeah. years ago fucking but, right <laughs> yeah I mean, we're just all trying to feel comfortable. You know what I mean? <laughs> like we're all just trying to feel comfortable in our bodies, however that may look. And it's not, and yeah, people, I, I, I really don't like people trying to, you know, essentially police people into how they should look or whatever like that. If someone wants to do this, then they can do this. If they, like, if you want to shave your head, fucking shave your head. Who cares? If you right. want to wear a dress, wear a dress. If you want to wear a tux, wear a fucking tux. It's like, no. I think we've basically covered all the questions. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that we could. Uh, this is an interesting question. Are there any myths about detransitioners that you want to clear up? If you can. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think we like kind of, you know, vaguely went over like a couple of those things that like people who detransition, it doesn't mean that they're not trans. It doesn't mean that they don't experience gender dysphoria. Um, they're very much real. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that people can go through. Um, and there are plenty of reasons, you know, why people detransition, whether it be the medication doesn't sit right with their body, whether the social aspects of it, you know, like, all of those things. Um, I don't know, like, I feel like they're like slowly breaking down, like as a whole since everyone started detransitioning in 2020, you know, like, I feel like that was like, I really just feel like the reasoning why there's such a uprising of it is because during that time, people were sitting with themselves. And so they were able to kind of dissect a lot of their thoughts and feelings that maybe they didn't talk about, you know, in the years prior. And 
now that it's starting to become a little bit more normal, it, there's not a stigma with it, you know, like people are feeling comfortable to come out and talk about it. So it's not necessarily that, oh, it's just, it's like when they say like, everyone just started transitioning. It's not the same thing as detransitioning. Like I'm sure there are plenty and many of people who have detransitioned just never talked about it, you know? So it's not like it's just this random thing that started happening. Like, oh, we're going to see it more and more often. It's like, no, I think it was happening. Just medical professionals and people didn't want to talk about it because it, it is this like fear type of thing. Like think about what therapist or medical professional is going to be like, okay, I'm going to prescribe you this medication. You're going to like, you'll have these surgery and all these things. And then they want to go back on that decision. You would feel like, oh my God, I contributed to that person's mistake or regret or shame or guilt about that decision. Like I could only imagine being a healthcare professional, analyzing everything that that person says and being like, okay, like, I think that they, this would be a good route for them. And then they change their mind. Imagine that feeling that they would have. I would feel guilt as a medical professional, even if they were like, it's not your fault. Yeah. You still and, are contributing to a really big decision. And, and it has to, and so that <laughs> I was going to ask you a question because, um, and it, people can't be right a hundred percent of the time, mm -hmm. uh, both sides, but now when, and obviously there's definitely like corruption when it, or is that the word when it comes to the medical field because there are people out there who are just kind of like um and i'm gonna have to do research on this because i seriously didn't think that it was you know that easy to walk into somewhere and have mm -hmm. to be like oh, yeah you're you're well now you have informed consent so they just got to tell you what's going to happen and you're like okay and you don't have to have a letter that's a thing you've never heard of informed consent I've heard of informed consent. Yeah. Because I just remember that I had to get a bunch of letters. Yeah. And well, back then, you know yeah. what I mean? It wasn't as common in a sense, you know? Fuck it. Yeah. Yeah. So that is, and I feel like the steps should still be how they were when I went through my stuff because it was very helpful because it was over. I knew how I felt when I was a kid and I still wanted to take the process slowly. Mm -hmm. to to make sure you know 100% this is what I want but but I I do want to say too like with that comment of like we're not always 100% sure of ourselves but in that moment I was 100% sure you know and I think that we like to think that because we change our mind that we were never 100% sure but I was I made that decision I was very conscious and I I did think about it but as you get older and go through experiences, you're like, oh, I didn't realize that this was going to happen. Or you can't, you know, project how you're going to feel in 10 years. Right. You know, so it's like, I was 100% in that. Like I, I, it was a big decision that I had to make, you know? Um, but yeah. So, wow. So I guess there's kind of mm -hmm. like, no... There's yeah. no way to be able to, to be exactly right True. about what people are going to do with their lives. You have to make the best decision that you can in those moments that you're experiencing them. You, can only, you can't plan anything. You can't. You can try to, but everything's going to go the way that it needs to go no matter what you do. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's, that's a really good thing to point out. Um, because I don't know, just because I do see a lot of people um, talking about healthcare professionals or whatever, and they shouldn't have gave me this or they shouldn't have gave me that and stuff. But then I would be like, but you were going to them and talking about that stuff. Mm -hmm. I guess but we're humans. Yeah. Like th that therapist is a human. That medical professional is just a human and they're day to day live. They're just like you and me. So it's like, someone is telling you something and you're like, okay, well, I read this and my colleagues have told me this, and this is what I do with this information because they're not feeling that feeling. And even if they are, they're like, well, this is what I did with my feeling. Like you're only taking the information that you have and you're trying to make that best decision. But we have to think that other factors can come into play. And that's where like the money aspect comes into play, the profiting off of these different things as well. So that's why it's so complex. Holy fuck. Yeah. You know, like it's extreme. It's an extremely complex situation that's going on in the world right now that like, there's so many like, 
you like it's like it's not just like a box right and you see all four sides or you know whatever like a square and you see all four sides like it's a fucking circle and there's like a million sides to that circle that you can see from every different view you know because I'm, we're living we're making these decisions in this moment like i can have an interaction with someone tomorrow that really makes me look at my life completely differently and i did not know that i was going to have that interaction this conversation that we're having i caused you to think about things that you're like whoa i didn't even i didn't realize that about that situation and same for you to me like did you like you didn't think that you were like i did my research in this but here i am giving you another bit of information mm -hmm. and so you have to look at it like that like and as as we get older we start to realize these things and it's really just age, you know, because more experiences and more experiences. So, but like that goes into even the argument, like, okay, we'll wait until you're older, but it's like, there's plenty of people that wait till they're 50 years old and still are like, yeah, I want to do this. You right. know, like, it's like, you right. can't, there's no standard. You just gotta fuck it. See what happens. Sadly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like that's really it. Yeah. I'm I'm happy with my transition. I still like I love everything about it, and I obviously still struggle with gender dysphoria all the time because mm -hmm. I'm very I'm self aware and shit like that. And just but for me, it was the right path, and I'm yeah. I'm grateful that I had access to all this stuff. I think this was a great conversation. Like, thank you for having me on your platform. I mean, you a lot of people see your stuff, and I have been wanting to reach other people and have these conversations because even just from this, like, we're still very similar, even though I chose a different path, you know, like we, you and I do have similar feelings. We do think alike, you know, all of these things. And so showcasing that to a lot of people, especially like you have some young viewers, you know, that are very in the binary in their transition too. And they don't even know that they're like stereotyping themselves. Like it's okay if you're very binary and you like to get your nails done or you like the color pink or like whatever the case may be of the opposite of that, you know, like it's okay to like those things. It doesn't mean you're going to detransition. It doesn't mean that you're gender fluid. Like we have to understand that men and women, male, female, masculine, feminine, like there's fluidity within those roles. Exactly. Always, whether you're trans or cis. So I think this is a good conversation. Um, yeah, I feel good about it. Yeah, seriously. Thank you so much. I Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, and I'm sure we'll have more conversations. I don't think this is the end of that. So Yeah. Once again, thank you guys for watching. Appreciate it. And uh I'll see you guys next week. Okay, bye. All right. Well, that is the end of today's video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you, Alia, for coming on my channel and sharing your story. And yeah, I will see all of you next week with a new video. Hope you enjoyed this one and have a great rest of your day. Okay, bye.